cast your mind back to March 2020, days before the first COVID-19 lockdown, a new online virtual trade show experience was launched. Little did they know at the time that the world was about to be sent into chaos with all physical trade show and events cancelled for nearly 18 months. With 45 years experience, commercial management at a professional football club and working within the Middle East and some of the largest trade shows in the world. In today's episode of The Print Pod, we meet Wayne Beckett. Welcome to The Print Pod, Wayne's World. Hello, Wayne. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. I feel like we've got an industry giant in here today from the print industry. 45 years experience. I'm um, not going to give away your age. Started very young. Very, <laughs> very, very young. <laughs> I think, first of all, let's start off with that, that journey. Publishing. Yes. Yeah, I, <laughs> back in the 80s, publishing was massive. Mm-hmm. Printed magazines, product cards, weeklies, monthlies, directories, all of, all of which have now gone. Mm-hmm. But at the time advertising was was massive so my brother worked for a company called Morgan Grampian uh, based in Woolwich and um, he got me in there so I used to sell classified started off selling classified telephone making 40 calls a day right. selling recruitment advertising um, on a magazine called Electronics Times and at the time I mean it was massive um, British Aerospace, Ferranti, Marconi you know, they used to be looking for design engineers, electronics engineers, and we used to sell full pages at three thousand pounds a week back yep. back then. So it was some big money. But uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where I started and got into print. And, and we spoke earlier, and we touched on it briefly. You were explaining to me for somebody who's you know fairly new to the world of print <laughs> in in comparison, the process and the energy it took to make that publication. Just want to talk us through that that process because well, you're yeah. talking, you know the driving down the plates and you know. yeah well I mean back in the day obviously nothing came electronically yeah. um, so you know people that have worked in in publishing will remember back in the days Red Star you know the the big ad agencies up in up in Manchester and Birmingham if they wanted to get copy to us they'd have to put it in an envelope take it to the station yeah. and then it would come down on a Red Star overnight train. So my job on a Tuesday night when we went to press was yeah. to collect all of that copy. So we would have bags of copy arriving in the office. Final pickup would be to go to um, to the Red Star office up in London and pick up all the copy that had come down and then drive it all the way down to our typesetters for them to actually lay it into page. Wow. Cut and paste, which is a term that's used <laughs> now, but that came from then. Yeah. They used to get strips of text I wasn't around in the lead days, but (laughs) strips of text, and they would actually cut it and paste it into boards, create artwork that then would be shot, films would be created. Teams of of sub-editors sitting down at the typesetters, proofing all the board artwork before it was made into film, and that kind of thing. It was a a different world. Hours of work, it sounds like. (laughs) Hours and hours of work. Hours and hours of work. I mean, we would would close the press on lunchtime on a Tuesday, um, the, the the newspaper would hit the 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 because uh, it had to go out by post, so it would hit on the Thursday. So we would spend best part of two days actually creating it before we even got to printing it and wow. and and dispatching it. Wow. Okay. Pretty, pretty 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 mad. It was hard work. Yeah, and and then you stayed in the publishing space until what the mid to late nineties. Is that right? Yeah, or? I I, pro- I progressed um, through the company and ended up as being a display ad manager and run a, a sales team. So we had about five reps um, in the UK. So um, I I I did that for a number of years and then decided to set up my own publishing company and launch my own trade magazine. Okay. What was that? So, <laughs> Tell us more. <laughs> well, so this was the start of it, really. So um, I had some friends of mine that was involved in the print industry. And um, at the time, there was there was quite a few print magazines, um, some of which are still around, but a lot have gone. So we launched Imprint, which was a monthly product magazine. And um, I went back to selling ad, ad space, but for myself. That must have been quite rewarding, because not only you... Now, you know, 
publishing something, but you're also running a business, marketing it, selling it, you know. Yeah, it, on paper it seemed a hell of a lot easier than it actually was. Um, <laughs> anyone that's anyone that's um, left a big company and handed in their company car keys and mm. and gone out on their own will know how difficult it is. Mm. But yeah, we 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 managed it for um, for about four or five years until I I eventually sold the magazine and um, and then moved on in my career. When did you sell? So we would have sold. Probably 20, 20, 2002, probably 2002, 2003, we sold it. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, I, the, as far as I'm aware, the magazine is still around. Imprint is, I, I believe it's the trade magazine now for the BPIF. Okay. It's, their, it's like their newsletter. Okay. That's pretty cool. Bit of a legacy there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from distance. So you've sold, you've um, put your millions in the bank supposedly or yeah, yeah, don't, disclose, don't disclose <laughs> <laughs> um, what was next after that uh, so then um, yeah when, after I sold the, the publishing company then um, a friend of mine's dad owned um, a used machinery company um, that used to refurbish Camorris okay. and um, they said how do you fancy coming and working for us and, uh, and doing a bit of sales and marketing so I went into the used machinery market and mm. um, I was selling refurbished Camorris. Wow. Um, you know, at, at that time we used to bring in machines and, and we would do everything to them, you know, repaint them, new rollers, you know, anything they needed to be doing. And they went out looking like brand new machines again. Okay, and how long were you there for? So I did that for about four or five years. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then um, yeah, I mean, that was, that was my first drooper that um, I went with them, which would have been sort of mid nineties. So um, yeah, so that was my first drooper. So yeah, it's selling used machinery, buying and selling used equipment mm -hmm. is um, is an interesting market to mm. move into. Yeah, I should say. I mean, already I can see a bit of a bit of a pattern here of your experience of your journey. You start off in publishing. You're now on hardware and offset presses. And interesting to see where we're going to go next. Um, so you moved to the Middle East for a while. Yeah. After. So, uh, so I I I've been working with a company um, actually out in Dubai, um, a big uh, printers in Dubai, and um, they just taken on um, a web press, a sixteen page web press, Kamori web press, okay. and I kind of helped them actually get that machine installed. Then they came to me and said, "Look, you know we." You know we've got the facilities now uh, we would we need somebody to work with that can actually bring business in um so before i knew it i was actually working for them as a consultant and and bringing customers over from europe into dubai um wow so um yeah so i used to spend a, a week in the uk making the appointments and then a week in dubai um showing them around and showing them you know what dubai was all about <laughs> so, so that yeah, that's quite an expansive, um, sort of suggestive statement. Can you can you uh, explain a bit more how that worked in terms of bringing them over to show them how it worked? Yeah, so I used to I used to talk to a lot of production managers from publishing houses in the mm -hmm. UK that used to produce you know some some long run publications. Yeah. Um, like in flight magazines, um, like like directories and that kind of thing. So initially they weren't too keen about having. Um, having their products printed in Dubai. Was this before sort of um, the big shift of IT moving to India and um, cost of the tech world? Or was this kind of around the same kind of time? Yeah, it was, it was about that time. So the print industry in Dubai, well, and, uh, and the whole of the UAE really, was, was really moving at a, um, a fast rate of knots. You got some big printers based in Dubai, like Emirates Printing and Zabil and, and several others. So what they were trying to do was was actually look at actually printing European publications in Dubai, mm -hmm. because they they was working on the basis that it would be far cheaper, yeah. even with um, you know exporting them or delivering them back to the to the to the UK or, or to Europe. Okay. So, I mean, as it as it panned out, 
a lot of the UK printers were actually moving at a great rate of knots as well. And you know, this is where the software comes in with automation and, and all of that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I, I ended up working for um, MBS doing that. And then we got involved in other areas and, and that kind of thing. But 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 Zabil was going through a big phrase where they bought the 16 page web, but just didn't really have enough work for it. Mm -hmm. And that's where you came in. And um, talk us through, uh, a visit how do the visits work or so what you can say to legalities it was tough it was tough so i used to i used to fly out and I, and the production managers and directors would fly into dubai i'd meet yeah. them at the airport you know take them to their hotel make sure they were comfortable take them out for dinner in the evening yeah. then the following day we used to you know spend a day on on site and show them around show them all the equipment and everything that we do take them out for dinner that evening and then and then take them to the airport the next day and then pick up the next one and do it all again sure. I mean, it, it's it's hard work I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it sounds easy but but it is believe me it's very hard work sounds like you should be working for the Dubai tourist uh, industry <laughs> rather than you know print print operation I guess also after that sort of visit not only do they get a, uh, an idea of how the operation would work but also an idea how the country operates as yeah, well yeah exactly and, and exactly and it and it's seeing the tech it, yeah. it's seeing you know so bill had a great uh, has a great operation there with with offset and and web and 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 you don't actually appreciate the the level of, of, of work mm. that they can do what's your your view on that part of the world and the growth in sort of print print marketing 20 years on what, what how do you see it now I mean, it's it's all about technology. I mean, this goes back to you know when I used to sell, you know, offset presses. You know, the the Far East and Asia used to buy all the the, the sort of older kit because mm -hmm. um, they were cutting their teeth on technology. So they used to buy old MOs and Swarm Zs and places like that, which some of the other the older listeners will remember. But now, as we found at Drupa just gone you know that the, there are companies in in the Middle East and Asia now that are buying brand new kit mm. so the the level of tech that's moved that's that's come on you know they cut their teeth on the older machines but now now they're actually you know buying brand new Heidelbergs I think they reported that a company in Asia mm. bought 12 yeah. Um, small Excel. purchase isn't it yeah exactly <laughs> so I think that's the difference they're learning they learn, they've they learned over the last 10 20 years mm. and now they're actually producing work you know that 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 can be um, delivered into in into Europe and the States mm, interesting yeah we definitely saw that in HP Hall as well yeah a lot, a lot of um, businesses from the UAE and other Middle East states looking at the Indigo range so that shows you um, change and, and the pace of change as well yeah exactly after the Middle East adventure IPEX was next on the agenda is that right um, yeah shortly after that yeah, yeah um, Trevor Crawford, who was the event director at um, at Informa um, who I used to work with back at Morgan Grampian days he was actually my publisher when I was the ad manager on design engineering um, I spoke to Trevor and, and, and they were starting to work towards IPEX uh, 2014 mm -hmm. um, and coming up to the next Drupal for 2012. So I came on board and uh, I was I was sales director for IPEX. So for those that are fairly new to the industry or probably maybe don't do as many events or have that understanding, talk us through how big IPEX was because I've, I've come into the space in the last 10 years and everyone talks about IPEX as if this it was just this amazing event that we've, yeah. we've sadly lost over time and yeah and tell us explain the scale of it and how important it was and and you know the details that people need to know yeah I mean it was it was Drupa-esque um, it wasn't as big as Drupa um, but it used to run every four years the same as Drupa it used to be at the NEC in Birmingham mm -hmm. and it used to take up all the halls. Right. It was one of the few full tenancy shows at the NEC. Okay. So we used to run um, um, every two years with um, with Drupa. So you'd have IPEX, two years later Drupa, two years later IPEX. And so IPEX... They, sorry, they, dovet they dovetailed each other? Yeah, so both four-year shows, yeah. but two-year two year gaps. Okay. 
And the way that it worked was that you would see equipment at IPEX that was, that was beta, and then you would go to Drupal two years later and you'd be able to buy the equipment. So, um, yeah, so the, the last one that ran um, at the NEC was in 2010. Okay. And then we moved it to London for 2014. Okay. Um, how do you get, so you said previous um, relationships with the publishing space got you into that. Was there anything else from the world of IPEX that you took that shaped your sort of career now? Anything that you were like, you know, any kind of grounding or kind of learnings or lessons that you <laughs> took from those days that put you where you were today because you seem you know pretty well experienced in anything pretty teflon coated when it comes to surviving a drupal yeah or... yeah well yeah i mean it i mean the, the the ipex times was was probably the toughest period that i've been through even though i was working for a big plc rather than working for myself because obviously after uh, drupal 2012 um the results that came back from 2012 um, meant that a lot of the larger OEMs had to rethink what they were doing in the exhibition space. Okay. Um, and consequently, um, IPEX started to implode, really. Um, we had already announced that we was moving it to London. Mm -hmm. um, we had spoken to all the larger stakeholders to make sure that they were pretty cool with that, and we all got buy-in from there. But after they started to see the ROI from Drupal 2012, when exhibition started to turn, mm -hmm. um, we got um, a lot of the big um, exhibitors, the big OEMs, pull out of IPEX for for twenty fourteen. Um, but you're you're quite a believer that, the, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the drop from twenty twelve in ROI on trade shows was down to the growth of digital content online. Oh, to yeah, totally. I mean, the thing is, is that we've been seeing exhibitions reducing in footfall over the last 10 15 years yeah. um and you know i know drooper at the moment again hit over the head with a big stick on numbers you know with 170,000 this year when they forecast 200 which was down on on um, the last drooper but which was eight years ago yeah well exactly <laughs> and a lot changes yeah. you know a lot changes a lot of the big oems now have got their own open houses they've mm -hmm. got their own demo centers everything's online so so there is not the real need to attend trade shows mm. as there was maybe 10 15 years ago mm. because if you wanted to know what was out in the market you had to go to a trade show mm -hmm. you don't have to go to a trade show now mm -hmm. trade shows work because people like to be face to face with people mm. you know we run printing expo online which we'll talk about later mm. but that was never meant to replace trade shows and, mm. and never will do mm. you know i've just spent 11 days at drupa and met so many people <laughs> made some new friends mm. met you at the airport which <laughs> which was which was good you know that's yeah. that's what this industry is all about yeah. Yeah. sales people love that yeah and 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 customers love that mm. they love coming to trade shows they love seeing their sales reps having a beer shaking hands and doing deals mm. and i think i think that's the way that trade shows are now mm. it's it's an experience for mm. the psps to come to events you know some of the stands were were amazing mm. the rico stand the cannon stand the heidelberg stand the list is is endless but it's a better experience now, I, I think, than it used to be. Now people come because they want to see the stands, obviously the kit, meet the people, shake yeah. hands, have a beer. I, I think that resonates with us at Infigo because we take our events quite seriously, but we always look to meet customers, meet partners, you know, you know have customer success will travel, customer support will travel, and we look to spend that time at that show, not just to necessarily sell yeah. or buy, but also, uh, other day-to-day -day operations as well so that word experience I think resonates I think I think the other thing as well is is that the, the quality of visitors have gone yeah. up I mean I remember the days when when printers would shut down for the day certainly for IPEX yeah. and send all their staff to yeah. IPEX for the day yeah. and they would walk around they would collect samples spend probably a little bit more time in the bar than they should have done <laughs> but but that's the thing yeah. and that and that boosts visitors numbers yeah. you know and and yes, it's great. It makes the aisles look really busy. You know, exhibition organizers can say, look at our numbers. 
But at the end of the day, you really only want the owners and the people you know that control spent. And ultimately, that was the death of IPEX because the numbers, the ROI, wasn't there. For yeah. Them. The, you know the trade shows took a big turn in 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 that period and yeah i mean it was reported back i mean we we for ipex 2014 i at one point we had nearly 10 million pounds worth of bookings mm. all the big oems was there and in the space of three months i had nearly seven million pounds worth of cancellations mm. you know that tells you something about the way that mm. the exhibitions mm. need to move. Sounds fragile, doesn't it, when you put it like that? It is. And this mm. industry is. It's driven by maybe 10 big players in the digital mm. and offset. Mm. If they're there, everybody goes. Mm. If some of them pull out, then it, it collapses. Goes, yeah, it's like a domino effect, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's interesting also, just before we move on, you mentioned about busloads of stuff coming to the event. I think there's a balance for me personally there's a balance needed from businesses to, to shut down to allow staff to embrace and go to these events and absorb and celebrate how great the industry is but at the same time not let those numbers cloud the ROI and the sales figures because yeah. like, like you say we, we as, as marketeers when we're booking shows we need accurate footfall numbers not you know there's a thousand people there and actually 500 of them are staff you know it's it's oh, yeah. it's one of those isn't it i mean i believe that the only way that you can actually assess a trade show is to speak to the exhibitors yeah yeah if if, if they if they've got roi then it's a good show and i guess that was part of your role at ipex that you had that sort of boots on the ground you know talking to them over over my time um with 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 ipex i've visited just about every trade show print trade show in the world yeah um and um with with varying success you know uh, you know graphics of america down in florida j gas you know they're, they've all got something different right. and 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 you know those that are still around obviously have got it right allow us to interrupt this broadcast with a short ad break are you ready to take advantage of the next printing revolution Access our white paper to find out how web to print has revolutionised the printing industry. Inside, we discuss the growing importance of print e-commerce and automation, whereby customers are increasingly seeking an Amazon-like experience, with businesses that can't provide this being left behind. So how do you take this one step further and put your customers in control? Access the white paper and find out how web to print is revolutionising the printing industry. How customers can find your business online. How you can learn from Amazon's huge success. How to enable your print business to make money while you sleep. The way in which potential customers want to deal with your business has changed. Are you adapting to grow? Download it now at vigo.net forward slash white papers. Uh, so after IPEX... We moved to the next stage of your of your workflow journey, MIS. This time it was imprint software. Yes. So um, um, so when IPEX finished in twenty fourteen, um, we was we was made redundant, which was the first time I've ever been out of work in my life. And um, funny enough, we used to work with imprint. They were an exhibitor at IPEX, and um, I got on very well with the with the owners. Um, and they asked me to go and work with them. So, so that was that was the other side of it then, because I was I was actually working with PSPs, yeah. looking under the hood at the yeah. way businesses run. Yeah. And when, as you will know, with any sort of software, you know, when you're looking at at, at selling a, a management information system, you know, you get to understand how these 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 PSPs operate. Mm, I think also you would have brought another angle to that consultancy with understanding your, from the publishing background yeah. and in the events background as well so that's quite interesting so after imprint resolve business management yes yeah so um obviously i i've been i've run my own businesses for the majority of my life and i always wanted to get back into running my own company and we was approached by Crispy Mountain, who had the Keyline software at the time, and um, you know it was cloud-based. It, it it had the connectivity that a lot right. of server-based. It it was kind of groundbreaking in its time. 
everyone's gone that route now. So of course, I think mean, you have to. Yeah, exactly. So um, myself and Chris Watson, who was working with Imprint, um, we decided to to go it alone and um, and set up Resolve primarily to sell Keyline, Keyline. MIS. So Imprint Keyline, so you've got quite a bit of knowledge on the MIS space yes. and software already. That's quite interesting. So from there, we're talking February 2020, quite an interesting year. Yeah. And this is what caught my attention when, when working with you. You came up with an idea for a virtual online yeah. trade show, right? Yeah. So, I, so, was, so before you go into it, was, was the IPEX sort of situation part of the, the driver with that? Seeing, yeah. Seeing the decline and... The, the, the main reason that when... Um, when I was working with Imprint, I was responsible for the marketing then, and, and we had a global remit, but we didn't have a global budget. So I, I was looking at ways of being able to market the company globally mm -hmm. um, without having to advertise in every trade magazine, you know, getting press releases translated and sent. I mean, you know, you know what <laughs> yeah. it's like. Yeah. You know, it, it was a very small part of my job, the marketing, yeah. you know, primarily it was sales. And at the time, I thought if there was a global platform that, that, that would get global visitors that we could actually promote our business. Mm -hmm. And then I heard about virtual exhibitions from VX and we looked into and explored that. And then, yeah, in um, February 2020, we launched Printing Expo Online. Mm. So what about um, sort of the process of creating something like this virtual world? I mean, how long did it take you to... To do that, I'm, sure, you know, I'm assuming somebody had to sort of design and create all the little characters, the little people you see as you're walking <laughs> around the floor. That it, it's not that complicated, to be honest with you. Right. The the work comes when you're having to create the renders. Okay. So we work from CAD files. So normally the 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 exhibitors um, would send us a, a step file, and then that would go into our studio, and then we create the three D renders of the machines. The actual environments themselves um, is is three D camera work. Yeah. Um, so that get, you get the full effect of actually being in 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 a in a trade show. Mm. Everybody has to register. There's visitor tracking, so you know you get stats back and data back from everybody mm -hmm. that visits your stand. Mm -hmm. And consequently, we've been running now for four and a bit years, and we've had a hundred and fifty thousand visitors from just about every country on the planet. Wow, and, and again, the timing was impeccable. So I saw this around March 2020. We had lockdown um, pretty much weeks after that sort of period. Yeah. But you had some big OEMs sign up very quickly, didn't you? Thankfully, yes. Because um, when we went live with it, obviously we there was only a month until the whole planet shut down. <laughs> um, but um, Muller Martini, um, were probably the first company to contact us and they wanted to create a virtual showroom. Okay. Now bear in mind, everyone's saying, oh, it was, you're a genius because you, you kind of predict it. I didn't know anything about COVID. And, um, and, and a month later, the planet shut down, but we'd all already started in conversation with Muller. Um, HP Indigo had, had, had contacted us. Um, and so had Zycon. So we had three big OEMs yeah, big that we was working working on, and everybody was working from home, so they could still send us the files. Mm. You know, there was still that ability to for us to be able to work. So right place, right time. Yeah, but more luck than judgment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love the honesty. One hundred fifty thousand users. So that that's great. From you know four years, that's fantastic. And I think you know, there's also an element of like you said earlier, the industry is sort of leveling out a bit now because we're back, we're back sort of in full operation again. And there seems to be like a cake mix scenario where you need to put many ingredients into getting the right mixture. Yeah. And I think a mixture of online and physical is, is the way to go. Um, Printing Connect then. So that, you did the virtual stuff. Printing Connect seemed to grow in that period. Talk us through um, what it is, what it does and and who it helps okay so we've got a very healthy database now of subscribers f through um, printing expo yeah so what I wanted to do was put together a a, a resource okay so 
you know, thankfully you've just joined Infigo yeah, and just yeah. joined. Yeah. So it, it is a one stop shop for companies, for PSPs, for print professionals to source information. Mm-hmm. So it's a directory type um, um, website that covers blogs, videos, product information, press releases, press releases. <laughs> so so it, it's a great way for companies like Infigo mm-hmm. again that mm-hmm. that sell globally yeah. but don't have a budget you know mm-hmm. big enough to be able to target every country every country yeah, yeah. Um, and as you know I mean we we ran the press release for you for HP yeah for Drupal that's right Yeah, and we put it out on one of our newsletters our newsletters go out to about 70,000 yeah. people and I think yeah. you had five and a half thousand yeah. views yeah. in, in, in two day. days yeah it wasn't bad was it it's not bad is it <laughs> Good return on investment, that one. Exactly. So before we go back on to trade shows and Drupa, bit of, I'm going to go slightly out of the industry. Dartford Football Club. <laughs> um, God bless them. God bless them. Um, what's your role there and how the bloody hell did you get involved with that? Well, as I said to you earlier, I'm not 100% <laughs> sure, really. Uh, my daughter um, played um, for the academy side mm-hmm. before she went off to university. So I got quite involved with the club. I used to play at quite a high level myself. So I used to love getting back into into the football thing. Um, when she moved on, I wanted to get involved with the club. Obviously, with a sales and marketing background, um, we got involved with sponsorship. So now my role at, at Dartford is, is one where I report to the board um, on all things sponsorship. We have a, we have a sales team that brings in sponsorship so I oversee that and then on match days I, I look after the sponsors wine and dine them a bit more like my Dubai days wow. and um, yeah I mean I, I love the club I've, I've been with them now for about four or five years we've not had the best season last season we're now being relegated but we'll come back we'll come back big and strong and we'll, that's we'll, the men's side isn't it because the yeah. women were second yeah they were second in the league five, yeah the yeah. Um, the the women have, have had a fantastic season, really have. There's some big clubs in that league as well. There's Ebbsfleet, Fulham. Yeah, Dulwich Mil- Hamlet. Millwall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, no, they have done really yeah. well. Yeah. Um, the management team there have, um, have really turned it around this season. So we're expecting some really big things from them. It's just unlucky they didn't go up this season. Mm. What's your plans with that role? With the Dartford yeah, role? Yeah, the Dartford role. Um, well, it's just, I mean, it's a volunteer role, so um, you know I'll get involved as 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 much as as my time allows. It's always difficult to mm. juggle, isn't, isn't it? You know. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I enjoy going. I enjoy watching football. Mm. I enjoy um, the the atmosphere. As I say, although it hasn't been the best one, it's it's never a good atmosphere when you're getting when you're getting, <laughs> getting relegated. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're open to develop the club. We've got a fantastic ground, yeah. so we're working we're working with the with the board and the sales team to uh, to develop the, the club. Are you finding it a challenge to get uh, finances in at that level um, in the current climate or? Well, getting relegated doesn't help um, <laughs> no. when you're going back to sponsors for 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 this year. Yeah. Um, thankfully, the vast majority have stayed with us, mm-hmm. um, um, and appreciate that it's just a blip. Um, but we've got a new management team in there now. We've got a new uh, new manager, um, a complete new side because, as you know, mm-hmm. you know most of the players go out of contract. So we're having a rebuild, but um, yeah, we're looking forward to to an exciting mm-hmm. and promotion season. Love that. Optimistic, positive. <laughs> Always. <clears throat> so let's go back to Drupa. We've spoken about it, we've touched on it many times in today's conversation. I bumped into you at Terminal 2, I think. Yeah, Terminal <laughs> 2, <laughs> Heathrow. Heathrow. Yeah. Um, you know, sort of, you and a couple of others, a small group of print extraordinaires. Um, I think it was your number five or six, Drupa? Right. Yeah, six, six, six troopers. Six yeah. troopers. Yeah, so I was trooper I was, veteran. I was ten when I went to the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was my my first, and and everyone I heard mixed reviews about it. Obviously, the challenge, in the sense of we've missed, we've skipped one, so we're eight years on. Um, I heard some people sort of feedback to me saying there wasn't much innovation or anything new there. 
Um, maybe they were looking for that. I don't, I don't know. I found it's a very good event to meet customers as well as as prospects. What were your thoughts on Drupal Twenty Four in terms of you know the event success in your mind and so we touched on it earlier and, and I know a lot of people are saying you know visitor numbers were down you know we've been seeing visitor numbers as I said earlier drop every drooper mm. every trade show um, certainly in the print industry but I walk the halls um, it's a long way to walk isn't it uh, 20,000 steps a day I averaged <laughs> over 11 days yeah um, and spoke to a lot of exhibitors mm -hmm. in various halls mm -hmm. friends of mine that I think that would be honest. Um, so, and my general feedback was that everyone was quite happy. Mm. Um, twofold. Firstly, we haven't had a Drupal for eight years. Mm -hmm. And and secondly, for the amount of business that was done. I mean, you look, you know, you, you see the press releases coming out. You always get press releases that, you know, oh, we sold this at the show. You take those with a pinch of salt. Mm. But I think generally because it hasn't happened for eight years people were just pleased to be in that arena mm. and you know karma who stand that we built and we work with they had a fantastic show they sold lots and lots of machines i think it's one of the best droopers they've ever done so that's really all you can measure it on i mean mm. yes it, it it wasn't the aisles weren't packed and i think it was the, the exhibition was thinly spread and maybe it could have been seven days rather than 11 days mm -hmm. but generally you know Drupal needs to have have a look at that but but I think generally there was new tech there it was obviously a big show for collaborations I mean a lot of companies announced that they're working with other big OEMs Automation was, you know, mm. as we saw with you in the HP hall. Yeah, yeah. I think automation, collaborations, and there was, and there was new, new, new kit that, mm. to be seen, depending on what, what, what part of the market you was interested in. It's interesting because it seems like your make your point is more. We, we've got to we've got to realign what our measurables are. So how do we measure ROI now? Whereas before, going back to the IPEX days, it was numbers of people um, coming through the door, maybe that's not immeasurable anymore, you know, maybe that's... It, it, it's always been sales. Yeah. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter how far you go back, mm. you know, it doesn't matter if, if, if attendances are up. If, if you're not selling equipment mm. or technology or software or wherever it is, you don't get that ROI mm. and you don't go back again. You know, I don't know any marketing manager that would would spend that kind of money doing a trade show <laughs> to find that they got little or no business out of it at the end. But but the, the thing is... Yeah, trade a job show, if they did. Well, exactly. <laughs> and and the thing is, is, as you know, it's what you put in running up to it as well. Mm. A lot of exhibitors just turn up and just, you know, put up their stands and go, you From know, where's, where's the people? Mm. You know, you have to work hard now at a trade show, mm. especially one as big as Drupal mm. that's got that many companies. Mm. You have to work hard. Your pre-show marketing has to be good. Mm. Your post-show marketing, all your follow-ups. Mm. The amount of shows that I've been to and, and spoke to companies and never heard from them a business card or they've scanned the badge and then you never hear from them never again. Never hear them again, that's right. And yeah. they're the first ones to bash the organisers because they've got no work out of it. Yeah. So yeah. pre and post is just important, just as important as, as what you do at the show. That's a really good point to share, actually. And um, and you, and you, like you say, you you disagree with some of those comments because you said you saw good innovation there. You saw some good, you know, some good things there. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm I'm not the most technological guy in the world, so I probably don't understand, you know, the technology as as as, as good as some people, but. You know, the stands that I saw were packed. The stands that I saw and spoke to were doing good business. And that, for mm -hmm. me, makes a good trade show. Yeah, agreed. What's the plans for the rest of uh, 24 for you, Wayne? <clears throat> so we're talking to a lot of companies now about our marketing services that we mm -hmm. offer. Mm -hmm. um, Printing Connect is, 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 is growing. Mm -hmm. um, so more trade shows. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got some more stand builds on the horizon. We've got some companies that we're going to be working a lot closer with for their overall marketing package. Mm -hmm. 
So more of the same. Any shows you want to reference? Or? So um, Print and United um, is a show that um, we're hoping that we're going to be working with. Cool. So a um, little trip out to Vegas. Um, shame that, that it's tied with Label Expo because Chicago, I love Chicago. I've done so many shows in Chicago. Um, but I can't be at, at two, no, <laughs> at, two no. at the same time, especially when they're 3,000 miles apart. <laughs> Yeah, um, it is a so we're hoping to be working pretty closely with Print United so we'll be out in Vegas I'm also working with a print show mm -hmm. um, up at the NEC mm -hmm. um, which is a, a, a show that you do you? yeah we, we've done it as part of the IPIA yeah um, but yeah well, Print United is definitely one that we're at we've got the same challenge with Label Expo yeah you know we've got we're committed to both. Yeah, there's a lot of shows going on at the same yeah, time. Yeah, and I think that's something the industry probably needs to look at, really, because I don't think it's it's ideal if we want to invest in this space for the for the future. Yeah. What do you... Um, I'm going to ask you one more last question. It's fairly deep, okay? What would you like to see in the industry, for the industry, in the next sort of period that we, we enter now? <laughs> wow. Um, that's the next bigger, 45 years the next 45 years <laughs> god almighty um, I mean it it's automation I, I, I you know from from my time working with um, with an MIS company or a couple of MIS companies mm -hmm. I certainly think automation you know the money there used to be a phrase back in the day that if the presses are turning the printer's making money mm -hmm. It's not always the case now. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to see printers selling print better, mm -hmm. um, but also improving on automation, cutting down touch points, mm -hmm. you know, being able to make more profit on jobs mm -hmm. and then staying around. I don't mm -hmm. think print's dead. Mm -hmm. I just think that it needs it needs it needs to grasp software better it needs a better understanding of software some companies have got it bang on yeah other companies you know that will struggle to survive mm. don't quite appreciate that we've seen that it's funny you say that we've seen some of our customers who have actually quite bold in telling us we make profit on a hundred dollar job you know and it's like a hundred dollar you know that's mad how can you mm. do that and then they do you know and some, and they're now pushing the system to see if they can make profit on a $50 job you know yeah. and it's like I love the passion the motivation for it but also I think if we don't embrace it we won't adapt and um, I think I think certainly that that printers have got to get a better understanding of what's going on on the shop mm, floor mm. Um, I certainly from again from my MIS days I think reducing touch points and understanding you know where where you can save money um, will help no end thank you Wayne and if people want to find out more about your products and services Printing Connect Online where best should they go um, well look me up on LinkedIn yeah um, link in the bio there <laughs> <laughs> thank you much okay thanks Chris thank you for joining us today on the Print Pod if you enjoyed this video please don't forget to like and consider subscribing to make sure you get all the latest from the world of print and marketing. Feel free to share what you would like to see in the next episode of The Print Pod in the comments below. For more behind the scenes content, don't forget to follow us on our social media channels in the links in the bio below.